Welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. We interview remarkable and thought-provoking guests about innovation, leadership, and change in the world of business. Whether you're an executive or an entrepreneur, our objective is to help you and your organization create an entrepreneurial culture, become more innovative, and better able to respond to change. Each week, we'll deconstruct world-class performance from the arenas of business, academia, science, and sports. Each week, you can expect key insights, fresh perspectives, and proven tools you can use straight away to make you more successful professionally and personally. With your host, Mark Bidwell. Hello, this is Mark Bidwell. Welcome back to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. If this is your first time listening, a very warm welcome. In this episode, we're joined by author, speaker, and entrepreneur, Franz Johansson. Now, Franz is the author of the best-selling book, The Medici Effect from which the now popular term was coined, a book that was recently republished because of an increased interest in the power of diversity of perspectives. Franz is a founder and CEO of the Medici Group, a consultancy firm which promotes innovation through diversity. Now, in the Medici Effect, Franz studies the impact that the sponsorship by the Medici family that brought together creative individuals from myriad disciplines had on what became one of the most creative periods in European history, the Renaissance. And more importantly for us, what lessons this has for our world of business today. And using examples from his work with companies such as Nike and Disney, Franz shares ways in which we can avoid creating barriers to innovation in our organizations by not acting upon our natural instinct to surround ourselves with like-minded people. And this is the theme we've touched on many times in the podcast so far. We also covered specific actions we can take to encourage the Medici effect within our own ecosystems including something that Franz calls intersection hunting. And I hope you enjoy this conversation with Franz Johansson. So welcome, Franz. First question, what is the Medici effect and what has it got to do with innovation? So when I wrote my first book, The Medici Effect, it refers to what happens uh, or what happened in Florence about 500 years ago. And it comes back to the Medici family that was able to sponsor uh, creative individuals from lots of different disciplines, sculptors, architects, painters, philosophers, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, from, from all over Europe, even as far away as from China, actually. And they brought them to the city of Florence, where they were able to break down the boundaries between the different disciplines, between the different cultures, and ignite what became one of the most creative eras in Europe's history, the Renaissance. And so when I look at the Medici effect, what I'm looking at is how were they able to create that effect? And what I wrote about was how are they able to create that effect and how can we do the same? And at its essence, what it essentially says is that diversity drives innovation because it was through all these diverse perspectives, all these diverse backgrounds that these people during the Renaissance were able to borrow and build upon each other's ideas to break new ground. Well, we, it, not only can we do that today, it is a fundamental fact of innovation is a fundamental driver of innovation. And so the Medici effect refers to this fundamental driver and that diversity drives innovation. And when you say diversity, I guess you're not talking so much about sort of biographical diversity. Is this more sort of cognitive diversity, the different disciplines, the different ways of looking at the world? Or, or are you talking about both? I'm talking about both. So what's interesting about this, and, and, and this comes up quite a bit, I talk about perspectives from different industries and fields and disciplines, but also perspectives from people from different cultures and countries, different gender, people with different experiences. And it has turned out, and this is one of those things that have become increasingly important as my work in, in this area has sort of got deeper and deeper, a tremendous amount, far more than I believe the vast majority of executives themselves have any inkling of really, comes from a demographic diversity. I mean, the experiences that we have, where, wherever they happen, however they came about, drive a tremendous amount of perspective shift. And in the book, I spent quite a bit of time talking about fields. This, for instance, I, I, one of my favorite examples uh, when I wrote this book, and still today, many years later, is an architect that, that borrows ideas from German ecology to design this extremely efficient building in Harare. It uses 90% less energy than any other building around it using these sort of termite design principles. And that is a clear case of taking one concept and bringing it into another field. But in a company, an organization, the most powerful intersections come from when different perspectives meet. And those perspectives are able to build upon each other 
and collaborate and find new avenues. So it's both. And so, I mean, you subsequent to writing the book, you worked with companies like Nike and Novartis and Disney and a number of companies. I mean, what are they doing in order to, you know, unleash or to nurture the, the Medici effect? What are the kind of things that leaders do or HR managers do or line managers do? Can you give us some examples? Yeah, it's a great question because actually the, the instinct is to, even though you might be intellectually aware of that this works, the instinct is to do the opposite. The instinct is to build silos. The instinct is to focus. The instinct is to surround yourself with experts, with people that are like you. So you have this whole thing, which gets increasingly reinforced. So the real challenge is, one, first of all, to understand the power of using this diversity of perspectives, the diversity of backgrounds to your advantage. But once you figure that out, the, the organization you're in tends to have erected incredible barriers to actually pull that off. And in order to break through those barriers, you have to find clever ways to unleash at least this diversity, unless you sort of, unless this idea sort of courses through the organization. So, for instance, I'll give you two examples that you can find from one at Disney and one at Nike. At, at Disney, they become quite adept at understanding how to take ideas and concepts from one part of their enterprise, from one part of their empire, and and leverage into something else. They even have a group called the Synergy Group, whose real job is to do that. They look across all their activities, essentially looking for can this sort of, can this play over here? Can we use this over, can we combine this over here? And what's fascinating about that is, of course, that their business is highly dependent upon IP, and their IP has, has tremendous power. One piece of successful IP, like a, a movie Frozen, for instance, can, if done right, play in lots of different uh, angles, lots of different places, in a park, in a, in a TV show, in, a, in, in products, and, and so on. And so ultimately, when they're able to, to, to look across and find ways to, to make these type of combinations, they, they, they can keep creating new stuff. At Nike, going back to another definition of diversity, which is more along the, the, the cultural line, we started working with them about 10 years ago. And actually, I share this story in the new edition of the book. And they really wanted to look at the new model of innovation. I mean, there's the, so there's disruptive innovation. There's, so you could talk about Blue Ocean. You could talk about uh, crowdsourcing. There's any, any number of different approaches to it, but how would they use, how would they be able to use diversity to drive it? And here, the focus, the emphasis of that was across demographic lines, countries, cultures, people from different backgrounds, gender, and so on. And what that led to was that increasingly managers, leaders started looking, how do I diversify my teams? How do I successfully bring in other perspectives, either by the team members that I hire into it? or by people that can rotate through it, or by partnerships that I can create with others in it. And so it's really impacted how they, how they think about even their, 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 whole, their whole talent and everything that follows. And I'd love to come back to that in a minute, that talent question. But just going back to the Disney thing, I mean, you know, one of the big biases, I guess, that you get, particularly in high-performing companies, is the not invented here syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do it better than anyone else. Any, any thoughts on how companies like Disney actually overcome that? Because it is real, even though, you know, it's a bit of a cliche as well, right? Yeah, I, I do think it is real. And in fact, the more successful a company has become, <laughs> the more this type of thinking tends to spread. And I think people can get confused to this thinking. I mean, one piece of the thinking, which might be possibly quite sound, is really around values and cultural norms. And any organization that is successful, that is sort of hard charging and driving, needs to kind of have that there's there's a there's a sense of who we are as an entity there's a sense of what is important for us as an entity and and what we value and that's one thing and you, you can sort of see an organization become resistant to innovating those those things but then again values are not, not necessarily something you want to be innovating all the time it is something that should be able to to lead you through times good and bad but then on the other hand you have a completely different thing which is ideas concepts and i think people can confuse those ideas and concepts being able to create porous lines print intersections with, with completely different industries becomes critical and successful organizations do that either by having uh, a healthy way of, of of introducing new people into the mix so there's a rotation they are very eager to have uh, to revisit people who may have worked with them in the past they go out they do something somewhere else and now can they become can they come back in again? The so-called boomerangs. The right? boomerangs, exactly. 
if fully leveraged, boomerangs can be incredibly powerful. I like to say, I mean, one of our clients right now has a new head of strategy. I just met her, I think it was on her fifth day on the on on the job. And we were simply talking about the fact that the probably the some of the most impact that this person could have is going to be over the next six months because this person has not yet bought into everything that is local or, or is within within this her new organization. And she's looking at it with fresh eyes and it just is more irreverent. Over time, of course, you become more careful, you understand the game better. And so you're just not as naive even about introducing new ideas. So organizations should truly capitalize on their new hires. This is when they will have the best shot introducing new concepts and ideas. I mean, which is, well, not ironic, but I mean, you know, the classic book about the first 90 days and people talk about the first 100 days or, you know, which is a honeymoon period. But what you're saying actually is that that's the point at which the individual has these very fresh perspectives and these unique ways of doing things. And they, they should really be brought into service by the company as quickly as possible before they get, you know, I won't say beaten out of them, but certainly culturalized out of them or before they get absorbed into the the mother culture, if you like. I think it's an incredibly impactful time if capitalized upon. And it has to be capitalized upon both parties. In other words, it's not enough that the incoming person is eager to do it because those ideas might not be recepted, like received well. The, this new organization also has to be able to take advantage of it. But certainly in our company, the Medicine Group, and the firm that I created, in those first six months, uh, we, we really tried to get as much insight as possible. That doesn't mean, of course, that this person can't be highly effective afterwards. I mean, now the person is, has been indoctrinated, essentially, to what, what, what a company is doing. And so now you're running, running, executing, but it's a different type of thing. You're no longer as, as, as mindful about introducing new ideas as you may have been in earlier. So, I mean, I'm curious about this. I mean, what specifically do you do? You know, someone comes in from the outside with background, with expertise that you recognize is strategically important for your organization, but you've also got culture, you've got processes, you've got a way of doing things, and you don't want this person to go in and blow them all up or disrespect them. I mean, what, what do you do as a leader to stop that person from being, you know, prematurely sort of homogenized? Or, or culturalized, if you like. So this really gets to how do you take an innovative idea and how do you actually execute on it within an organization? Uh, and so it, I think that it holds true in that situation, but it holds true throughout the really a life cycle of an organization. How do you take something that doesn't neatly fit in with the organization's sort of dominant paradigm and how do you make that thing, this new idea, possibly stick? And obviously there's been a lot of thinking uh, going on about this throughout the years. And so... Some of this stuff is fundamentally true, which is it is very difficult to know what's going to work or not work with an idea that hence it follows very naturally that you have to test ideas. That means that if an idea is, is particularly true with new ideas. In other words, I don't think it's a good approach to say, I have a new concept. Now we're going to run with that. But I have a new concept. Are there ways that we can test this? Are there ways that we can incorporate this? Are there clients that might be, in our case, we ask questions, you know, are the clients that have been with us for 10 years, for instance, are they open to trying this like tomorrow in a small way? I mean, that's I'm, I'm always extremely excited when that happens. It's a new way of looking at it. I hadn't really thought about this way before. Where can we put this to the test? And let's not waste any time really kind of doing that piece. But what I'm hesitant about is here's a new idea. And now that means that we're going to overhaul how we do this. Not a good cause. I, I, I don't think it's good for several reasons. It's not good for culture, but it's not also not good because you don't know if it's going to work. So it makes no sense to actually go go all in on that. Yeah, it's fascinating because this is an area that, you know, we're increasingly aware of is how do you, you know, I'm an anthropologist by training and, you know, how long does it take before someone, you know, who joins a new culture actually starts looking at the world through the same lens of that predominant culture they've just joined? It's probably somewhere between three and six months, but I guess it varies. Well, and here's actually where, you know, these ideas around innovation, which are really, I mean, I, I, the way I'm viewing them, this is a new way of thinking about innovation involving diversity. Now, there's another term that comes up a lot when people talk about diversity, which is inclusion. And actually, what the way we think about it, the medicine group, is gets to this question that you're asking. So here's what tends to happen. You will have a person that is different, that enters a team. Now, in fact, actually, what you often find is that this person can come from a different part of the business if the business is large enough. So they actually, you know, they may come from a part of business that was uh, came through an acquisition. They, they're looking at things a little bit differently. But be that as it may, this person enters the team and they're different. Maybe they're different functionally. Maybe they're different demographically. Maybe it's the only woman on the team. And maybe so you have you have different ways of thinking about what that difference is. Okay, so now you're part of the team. The first thing 
that the person's going to do, generally speaking, is try to figure out how am I successful on this team? Which means how can I adopt the norms, behaviors, ideas quickly? And the first thing the team does is conveniently ignoring everything about what makes this person different in the first place. If they're lucky, they might even bully, but that's a different story. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So the problem is clear. Now, the solution also becomes then equally clear. Being able to find a way to have this person remain with a fresh perspective for as long as possible becomes an imperative. And what we have found is the most straightforward way to do so is to actually bring in, to the degree it's possible, another person that is different. And actually, I, I, we talk about a, uh, it's like a quantum leap type of difference between literally, and I'm talking about real numbers, literally having one person different on a new team and two. One person different on a new team will lead to assimilation far faster. Two that are different, and they might not have to be different in the same way, they're just different from the dominant idea of that of that team, they are able to more strongly support each other, defend each other in that difference. And the team themselves, the dominant team, can't ignore their difference as easily. So much of the work we do is about enabling these different types of intersections to happen. But when they do happen, also ensure that they're sustainable. Yeah. And just building on this, I mean, the thing that I found fascinating about the book is, or one of the things I found fascinating, is that when you have a diverse team, actually the execution happens far more quickly because, and I quote, you've got more pathways. Yes. Which, I mean, just say a little bit about that, because that, that was very profound, I think, because I hadn't, I'd never made that connection. Yeah. So just put it in context, right? If in the past, let's say, five to 10 years, there's been a tremendous amount of work done around the notion of agile, being agile, being lean, pivoting. And what what all of these things really get to is that, again, innovation is unpredictable. So do not, don't buy into the notion that you are, you know, you got it right the first time. You have to maybe switch course pathways. So people talk about that, but what they don't talk about really as much is, well, how are you going to be agile? How are you going to be able to pivot? And what we've found, particularly in a corporate context, is that diverse teams are faster and they work much faster with even fewer resources. And the reason why is that if you have a team of a homogeneous team, let's say a team of experts that all kind of view the world roughly the same way, when they start t- discussing how are we going to make this idea happen, they will all sort of arrive at the same conclusion, which might be that we should talk to Paul. So Paul is the main guy for this. And we're going to go to Paul. And then you go to Paul and Paul's busy. Paul's really busy. And now things start slowing down. And anybody that's listening to this that works for a corporation knows have recognized this situation over and over again. And then, okay, well, uh, maybe there's an opening in, in three months. There's a window here. And, and so you, you, you kind of you restructuring your timelines. A diverse team may come up with Paul, but they may actually have six, seven, eight other pathways to make this first initial step, what we call an SES, a small executable step. And so it's not just Paul. Actually, you could work with this person over here, that group over here. There are are any number of other pathways in which one can take this first step to test the validity of the idea. And that includes even outside parties. Who should you partner with to try this? And the more diverse team, the more diverse the team is, the more possible pathways exist. The more surface area you have sort of uh, facing inwards to the organization and outwards to your your community of, of, of clients and partners. And hence, diverse teams tend to just be much faster and able to move with fewer resources. Yeah. Actually, you articulated this idea of the ecosystem, which is at the heart of what we're doing far better than, than I can. I mean, it's about having that the breadth and the depth of the network that you can tap into. The strength and the robustness of your, and the diversity of your ecosystem will be a resource for you moving forward far more quickly than if you're in a monoculture where you've got a pretty fragile ecosystem that you're surrounded by. That's right. And this is a fractal type of idea. So, you know, you, it, it's true for an organization, but it's also true for division, it's true for a team, it's true for you as an individual. As an individual, think about how you have built your skill sets, your relationships, your networks. What areas do you have to tap into when what the pathway you chose no longer works? The more diversity you have in that, the more possibilities you will have to move in a different direction. So it works at sort of any level of granularity. Brilliant, brilliant. So let's switch gears, Franz. I mean, there's we've got a, a couple of other areas I'd love to cover. Um, at the heart of the Medici effect are these ideas of of intersections, and you talk about intersection hunting. Yes. C- can you maybe just say a little bit about that, and then segueing into you know the four strategies that you have that you propose for breaking down some of these associative barriers, or actually strategies for better intersection hunting? Can you just say a bit about that? 
So with intersection hunts, the question is, how can you quickly, quickly introduce a new fresh perspective? I mean, you may not have time to hire a a, a diverse team. You need something today, tomorrow, something like that. And what we encourage people to do is to either look for sources of inspiration that are that are very different from the ones that you normally look at. And I gave a piece of advice to the CEO of a very large media company, one of the world's largest media companies. He just heard my keynote and said, you know, these are terrific ideas. What can I do now about it? And I started talking about some tactic or strategy. No, no, no. I mean, literally over the next hour. Okay, I said. Um, what are you doing over the next <laughs> You got him. You got him. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what are you doing over the next hour? I'm going to the airport. All right. When you get to the airport, walk into a newsstand and select a couple of magazines that you would never, ever read. And then use those magazines as a source of inspiration to create new insight into the challenges that you're facing. And actually, when I, I, I came back to, to do another keynote, uh, not much long after that, and he, when he was introducing me, he was saying he was reading more wedding magazines than ever. And, and, um, <laughs> okay. and, and the point he was making was that there's all kinds of things in how they are looking at challenges and problems that I can now can begin to apply to the, the ones that I'm, that I'm facing. And they're fresh. These are not the same things that I would have found looking at my normal sources. So intersection hunt means to actively, actively look for a field or a discipline or a person or culture that doesn't necessarily make immediate sense. And then through that, make a connection. Try to connect it to the issue, opportunity, challenge that you have at hand. And of course, you can do the exact same thing with people particularly in a company, I many times see people who don't even necessarily know who's across the hallway. And even if they know, they don't really interact with them. We have a tool, I guess you can call it, where we say, look, take 10 minutes, go to them with an issue that you're facing and talk to them for 10 minutes to get their perspective on it. As long as they are different, maybe quite different from who you are, they're going to look at it in completely fresh ways. And the best case where I saw this play out was these risk managers for a bank they said, um, look, this is great, but across the hall, we have marketing. And marketing doesn't really understand any of the stuff <laughs> that we do. And I said, try it. And they did. And what was fascinating is, of course, marketers think about risk management. They just think about it differently than what the division of risk management does in the bank. And so, so people have just become so stuck in their very definition of risk management. And, and I mean, they stayed there for like half an hour because they were getting a completely different take on how to think about risk. Yeah, yeah. Why is this so difficult? Because at the heart of it, we like to believe that success comes from some sort of rational choices that we make, rational decisions, logical decisions. And logical decisions, though, are based in in sort of our experience. That's kind of, we have a sort of fairly muddled approach that we think about rationality and and, and logic, because it's based on what we've seen work in the past. And then we extrapolate, and that becomes sort of the stand-in for logical rational. But in fact, what this asks us to do is to talk to people, interact with ideas and concepts that don't necessarily make immediate sense, at least not in the very short term. And that's the piece that that holds us back. Here's what's really amazing about it. Once you start thinking about the world this way, you start constantly, I mean, sometimes every day, find the value of not taking the instant short-term approach, of instantly going to the person that you know knows the answer, but maybe trying somebody else. Once you have done this enough, it becomes a part of your overall, well, first approach, then behavior, then being. And the truth is that if you want to be successful with innovation in a large corporation, you cannot be thinking short term all the time. You have to actually train yourself to think beyond that. And this is a way of getting on that training. If you are not able to take 10 minutes to talk to somebody whom you're not sure is going to provide value to you right now, well, then how are you supposed to ever be able to look beyond the quarter? Yeah. I mean, it sounds, I just wondered, the CEO who grabbed you after the, yeah. after your keynote and said, I mean, presumably that's the outlier. I mean, what, what's the most common challenge that your audience has around your material? Yeah. So first it has to do with accepting the unpredictability of innovation. That's actually, everything stems from that. The medicine effect really stems from a this fundamental idea. Every trick that can be used in the book gets used so the executives can try to lock down innovative success. Maybe they analyze things over and over and over again, which gives them more numbers, but truthfully, not more certainty. Maybe they uh, say, well, we're going to put a lot of money behind it, as if that is not going to guarantee success. But obviously, if that was the case, every single venture capital firm would just put it $100 million behind every idea they see, and, and they'd, be, they'd be successful. 
clearly they don't do that because, well, it's not a successful approach to innovation. So they're looking for ways to lock down predictability. That is really the, the, the fundamental challenge. So they got to overcome that. That's number one. Number two, they have to overcome their instinct as to who knows what, who is smart, who is valuable, who do I need to talk to? And in my experience, the only real way to do so is through, is really through, well, it is through experience. So by exposing executives to repeatedly seeing and experiencing the value of these different perspectives, the value of exploring intersections, they themselves begin to develop a new intuition on this. And it falls really through with the leadership model that we have, where we believe that most leaders rarely would ever, when they have to make a call, go back, pull out a book, flip to page 86 and look at what the framework is there. They work off of an intuitive sense. So what has worked in the past and what hasn't. And then sort of injective new ideas. So we try to basically increase that level of intuition for leaders. And that comes from, from that type of stuff. Then there's organizational barriers all the time. You know, there's incentives are aligned to really have you focus on this one thing. So why would you ever then focus on something else? You have a whole structural sort of network of things that becomes really challenging to break through. So you have the individual level and you have the organizational level, both of them, which can be, well, can be very challenging. Yep, yep. Now, I mean, so, I mean, I think you touched on it, but the question that was going through my mind is, so let's say you get the CEO on board and he's now reading wedding magazines versus Harvard Business Review and, and his, you know, his intuition is being developed and he's, you know, he's, he's talking to people in different ways. What can you do to actually be sure that this reaches deep down into the organization versus hitting the first buffer and disappearing in a, in a puff of smoke? <laughs> right. So a CEO sort of thing in this way is, is one thing, and they may tell some others about it. But in order to be successful, you actually have to be in an environment that thinks this way. It doesn't make sense if you are eager to connect with somebody else, but that person doesn't even understand why you're doing so. And so in order to be successful, you have to expose this type of thinking through all layers. Even if a CEO tells people to think this way, they're going to discount what the C- or a senior level executive. They're going to discount that because what people say is, well, did you do that to sort of rise in the ranks to get to your position? And they have to say, no, I did. I did something very different. I just listened to what my boss wanted. I did that, for instance. Maybe this is time on tradition. And so the way we've been successful at it is that we have created lots of exposure points where people can, can not only understand the heart of the medicine effect, but also put it to practice using all kinds of tools. What happens when you go into a situation and you decide to reverse assumptions about that situation? You're, 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 you're looking at how the assumptions you make. We just did this last week with a, uh, a huge medical device company. What are the assumptions you make about this particular sector? And then just get rid of all of those assumptions, what is left? And what happens is that it naturally forces you out of your comfort zone into another one. So these are the type of tools, tactics, that force you into the intersection and unleash the Medici effect. So yeah, those are elements where the intersection hunt is another one, rotating people on your team. So maybe you can't actively or instantly introduce new people to a team, but can you have somebody join the team for the meeting and then sort of leave? We, we find great success in being able to do so because you want somebody for half an hour, an hour. As long as they're contributing their insights, you're creating this fresh perspective. Wonderful, wonderful. No, I mean, Franz, I mean, you know, we could go on for some time, but I know time is short for both of us. So three questions that, I, that we discussed beforehand, forgive me, I'm not sending them in advance. But the first question, what have you changed your mind about recently? So I think that's a great question. And one that we should be asked frequently. Uh, here's one thing that has uh, stood out in my mind, and which is that even when executives inside of corporations really understand these ideas, truly understand, and, and I'm talking in particular, the, the notion of trying something in a small way, uh, quickly, to sort of gain insight, and then maybe pivot. This particular notion, they, they can't execute it in that way because they're so used to thinking big, big numbers, projects. So it becomes a massive contradiction, of tension. And I used to think that the way to overcome that is to have them maybe experience this. So they can be part of a team where they're, where they're doing this. And indeed, it is helpful to cement the understanding of that. 
But when it comes to successfully introducing this way of thinking in an organization, you still have to do it in a way where they can talk about millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions of dollars, like numbers that they're comfortable throwing around. It doesn't make sense to talk about an idea that is starting in a small way and is only put $10,000. Nobody's really impressed by that. But if you can talk about an approach to ideas and maybe launching multiple of these, and you can do so in the scope of $10 million or $100 million, all of a sudden people get interested. And I really had to rethink my entire approach to leading this conversation because I've been so steeped in this notion of moving fast, small numbers, but it doesn't get the traction simply because every day they're dealing with numbers that are far, far larger. So even if a $10,000 test was extremely successful, they still can't understand what that means into their day to day. And so I have now been able to, and we've been looking to and what we the way we talk to our clients is all right now that you get the basic principle let's get back into the world that you live in so that you can actually move the needle and that world is run by millions and billions yeah what's interesting here is i mean we we need to be careful to or i certainly need to be careful that different perspectives i mean perspectives all have value for the individual and clearly if an executive is used to dealing with billions of dollars then that's a perspective that's of that serves them well in that organizational context. And we can't impose our perspectives necessarily on their perspectives, or we do so at our own peril. We do. And part of it is empathy. Okay, so let me walk a bit in your shoes, right? I mean, I think that is that is that becomes critical when, and particularly when you're coming from sort of thought leadership perspective, like I do, where people are asking me about what to do. Yes, but to stop and then put yourself in the other person's shoes and say, how's this received now? How are they able to take these ideas? And instead of talking about maybe one idea and pivoting, Maybe we should talk about 50 ideas and pivoting. This all of a sudden, now they can now they can work with that. That's the level of scale that they're comfortable with. And it took me quite some time to get from the first point to the second. Yeah, yeah. Great. Second question, where do you go to get fresh perspectives to help you, you know, solve problems or make decisions? I mean, what, what what's your <laughs> what's your equivalent of, of picking up a wedding magazine at an airport? Uh, I mean, so the true answer is that... I, and I do want the true yeah, answer, well, fans, I mean, please, yes. The, the, the truth is I see them literally everywhere. So yeah. instead, the, the more interesting question for me is, how do I choose to spend the next sort of couple of hours of the day to increase the number of unusual perspectives? So for instance, I now have, I don't really have much routine in what I do. I know that a lot of, a lot of books, a lot of uh, approaches will tell you, you need to have routine, you need to have habits. I have try to break those. Maybe one day I walk to the subway. I live in New York City. Maybe the next I take a car. Maybe the next I'm walking. I'm, I'm choosing to, we have a, our office on the 26th floor. I take the elevator to 23rd floor and then I walk up three floors. And what, what this is all doing is, is exposing me to new perspectives, new insights. I'm running into people that I would not otherwise have met. I'm allowing myself, last night I, was, uh, I had dinner with a, uh, one of the former editors of The Economist. We were chatting about something and uh, he was on his way to something else. Well, I was normally, I would have just said, we're great and I'll, I'll, I'll catch you later. But actually what happened was I followed along. The, our, our kids had already gone to sleep at that point and met a whole bunch of other folks. It, it, in many ways, one can view this as a social type of uh, interaction. For me, it is actively looking for intersections, actively saying, where can I learn new things? And perhaps the biggest place, the, the, the one thing to now give you something more specific comes from uh, TV shows and movies. I will look at a movie uh, sometimes over and over again to try to apply a different lens. Why? Is this happening? Why am I feeling this way? Why, how did, why did the plot unfold? What could the director have been thinking? What was the actor thinking? What was the cinematographer thinking? And then every single time I get to an answer there, I say, what can I learn from that? So movies has become sort of my wedding magazines specifically. Interesting. I mean, as you were saying that, Franz, I mean, we all know the story, I think, of the, of the Netflix algorithms, and which are designed to I suppose reinforce, you know, you like this, therefore you're going to like that. But the um, the connection is based on similarity versus diversity. So, uh, you know, we all live in our own little bubbles, and I finish one series, and so then Netflix tells me to watch something else, which is very, very similar. And I guess the, uh, you know, this is this is part of the world that we're living in, where a lot of our recommendations are driven based on similarity versus diversity. I suspect. I think it's a, a regressive type of concept. I, I'm no longer on Facebook because. 
it was became obvious to me that the inputs, the ideas, they, it, it just kept on feeding on itself. And so despite the fact that Facebook, for instance, to pick, I mean, the same idea as sort of uh, Netflix has an incredible opportunity to introduce you to new concepts, new ideas, new things. Of course, the business model uh, suggests that they should do the opposite, which is to just keep you kind of clicking, 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 doing the same thing over and over again. And so I would say to anybody who's listening to this, be wary of 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 the these sort of seemingly virtuous circles because they're more really like doom loops. At least I'm thinking about it. They get you into this one narrow point of view of the world. Now, this is a lot of talk about this from a politic, sort of policy and, and political standpoint, but the same is true for how you view your industry. The same is true for how you view your model of leadership. Over and over again, we get it reinforced, strengthened, when in reality, we should do the exact opposite. And the world has never had more different set of ideas going on than it does now. It's just we kind of actively shut them out through these AI and algorithms. Well, and, and with the active ideas, I mean, it's also easier to connect with all those active active ideas never before as well. But yet the industry is, as you say, connect making making false connections through these algorithms. That's right. There's another piece around it as well. What is an idea that goes viral? Have you noticed how today, say over the next two or three days, there's going to be something hitting across the internet that both you and I will watch and process and all at the same time, which means that now, yeah, we have something to talk about. Oh, did you see this in event? Did you see incident? Did you see this video? Did you see? Which is great. It sort of fosters this sort of commonality. But what happens is actually that, again, setting yourself up for not being the one with the different perspective. You're kind of having the same perspective. Yeah. And yeah. so it's the AIs that sort of keep us in the same bubble, but it's also the instant spread of a particular concept that can just become dominant. And again, now people look at it and go, oh, you can imagine a viral video that a thousand marketers around the world will look at it and go, that is what we need to do next. And now a thousand marketers are working on it at the same time as the source of inspiration for the next thing. You're not really setting yourself up for success. In fact, I would be very, in my mind, one should be careful of using that as a source of inspiration because simply because it's been viral. You have to look at it other places. And, and as you say, as to reinforce the point, this is not just about people sitting at home on Facebook oh, you know, oh. with a beer in front of them. This is what happens in the business world, but it's just disguised and dressed up in a slightly different way. That's right. That's right. Yeah, wonderful. Final question. What's been your most significant you know, failure or low, Franz? I mean, and what have you learned from it and how have you applied that learning? Yeah, you know, for somebody that views every failure as learning, views every failure as success, as long as you're still in the game to keep trying another time. It's a question that I struggle with simply because of the perspective shift. I don't I, I don't think that most failures should really be viewed as failures. That said, I believe that I developed a blind spot a number of years ago where what I was focused on too much was uh, business models, concepts, ideas as I was building the medicine group. And the one piece that kind of was left out of that was really the... What, for lack of a better term, the human side. What does it mean to bring someone on that may be having all of these pieces to the puzzle, but they may have a different value system, they may have a different perspective on things, on how to even do things. It's easy to paper over those things because they, they hear the coming of all this other stuff that is really tremendous. But if the value system is, is off, you're really setting yourself up for a massive failure. And that's indeed what happened. I, I had somebody on board that uh, just looked at the world differently. And uh, I think it set us back for quite some time. And I, I carry that with me now. It's really been a, a much deeper understanding of, of, the, of how important it is to be, to be mindful of that aspect as well. That's just as important as any business model or any sort of concept. Well, and I can relate to you. I mean, I've made every mistake in the book on my entrepreneurial journey. But one lesson which my um, co-founder brought on board is there are only two things ultimately we should be looking for in a new hire. One is, do we rate them? I.e., are they good? Are they world class? And number two is, do we trust them? And often you can find one of, one of those, but very rarely do you <laughs> find both of those. And that's uh, you know, but you get you you tend to you know, I, I fall into I fall into the trap where yeah, I trust this person, even though they're not very good, or this guy's great, but I'm not sure I trust them. Either of those are fatal for a startup, and they're fatal for any organization, of course. Uh, they are, and uh, but I love the simplicity of that rule. I think it's extremely true for any startup. And you know what? We get tempted to abandon them simply because, you know, we may need somebody right now. And if they can just do the job, we go for it. But there will be a price to be paid 
down the road. Always is, always is. Franz, this has been great. And thank you very much. Where can people get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. Um, there's lots of places. One can go to uh, my uh, website at francjohansson.com. And we'll put them in the, in the show notes. But if you just call them out and then we'll we'll articulate them. Yeah, francjohansson.com. And ultimately, that will send you to the medicigroup.com. So those are the two sort of uh, between my consulting firm and, and, the, and the personal page. There's a Twitter on there as well, and LinkedIn. Those are sort of the, the ways that I interact with folks. Wonderful. Well, I mean, very grateful, Franz, for you know for your time today. I mean, I've I've learned a lot, you know, preparing for it and talking to you, and really, very, very grateful for your openness and also for your insights because this is a fascinating area, and um, you know, it sounds like you're doing you're having great impact in a number of organizations. So, very, very grateful for this. Thank you. This was I really enjoyed this podcast. Um, I, one thing to to note, we didn't talk about this. I just realized, but I just realized now that you tend to contest contextualize an episode right before they, they come on. And this book was re-released by HBS Press last year, but the original edition of it came out in 2004. And so the and HBS Press rarely re-releases any books. And so why did they release, re-release this one? And the reason why was because they felt it is even more relevant today than it was when it came out. And it's really taken on sort of a new life because of that. A bunch of more languages and translations. I think it's 20, 21 languages now that it has in translation. And 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 the world that we live in right now is one where everything is converging between various industries and technologies. A diversity is more talked about than it has ever been before. And innovation, of course, is the frame in which everything is played up against. So you you have you have these ideas. And so when you're contextualizing it, it could be interesting to note that this is, I wrote the book as an evergreen idea of a book, but man, if it's not exceptionally true right now that the Medici effect is playing out, I, I think that has been, that has been one of those, one of those things that we've seen full force. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and it's interesting, my, my story, I mean, I, I picked up the book about two and a half years ago and read it on an airplane and enjoyed it and put it away. And, um, and it, you know, there was some really good stuff in there, but I wasn't really, you know, and I began to think, well, I want to get you on the show, which and we, I know we've been in conversation for some time, but when I, I couldn't find that book, Fran, so I went on to Kindle and bought the new one. And it was almost like, I mean, it resonated so much more, partly because of the work I've been doing, but also partly because I think the intro chapter is um, really contextualized it and brings it forward in in a in a way that is um you know it's almost a different book even though it clearly isn't it was for me anyway so um yeah that must be the reason that as you say that for those reasons and i think the other thing that's fascinating i mean i'm i'm a bit of a reader as you might have imagined i mean if i look at the new <laughs> leonardo da vinci bio which yes. i'm working my way through at the moment you know and he talked i mean it's all there in the in the, uh, in the first chapter about what the medicis were doing and what florence was like yeah. and and why it was such a hotbed of not just economic innovation, but also sure. cultural, cultural and social. Yeah. And, and it's, um, yeah, no, fascinating. So as they say, there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come, right? That's right. And I wrote another book called The Click Moment, which when you get a chance, you might want to take a look at that. It is a book that it, it didn't, it didn't really um, hit it as well for as the measure effect by any by any measure, but it did among very senior executives, and it still has a, just a huge impact on that because it's just it's a book where I just took a far more provocative point of view on the world. I really go all in on the notion of uh, serendipity, randomness, the unexpected in a way that I and I think was a certainly the common. Once I've been getting out of that, it's been a much more fresher, more practical take on it than, say, somebody like Nassim Taleb or there's a few others that sort of been obviously in that space as well. And I'm really sort of saying that, look, the, most of the most of these sort of ways that things get done, these are post facto stories. I mean, uh, people people take these stories and, and put them together very neatly after the fact. Beforehand, though, it, it doesn't look as neat. And I think you really enjoy it. I think it's particularly a book for, for people that have read a lot of business books it tends to come across as a very fresh perspective. And so I would recommend you taking a look at that as well and seeing what, what resonates for you. I, I will. And I'll do that. And if if and when, you know, maybe we can, um, you know, bring you back on the show to talk about it in, in a few months. But let, let me let me offer you one thing, because a wonderful book, which takes half an hour, an hour to read, which you might not have come across, is called Lucky or Smart by yeah. Bo someone or other. Have you ever read it? Yeah, Lucky or Smart. This is... Um... Is it Bo Burlingham who, yeah. who built a built an internet company even though he didn't, or his his software developers built one company while well, he thought they were building something else. Yes, he realized that he was he was smart enough to realize that he was being very lucky. And basically, you know, the business exploded. Then he sold it. Then he then he cashed out the options the day before the Nasdaq crashed, and he invested it in something else that went through. You know, and he was. It's a really interesting book because most of us, we're lucky enough to have some success. We think we're very smart, but as you said earlier on in the interview, luck plays a major role in it. 
Oh my God. I think it has, uh, it has an outsized influence and the people that, that are actually smart, if you will, are those that expose themselves to more possibilities to get lucky uh, on the one hand. And second, they don't, their ego allows them to recognize when they have been lucky, just as you describe right now. Like, wow, there's this, like, it didn't go the way I expected it to, but I'm okay with that. I can, I can change what I'm doing. I don't have to be as wedded to these set of ideas as I've been in the past. And you can capitalize on it. Uh, I'm going to check this book out. Basically, the whole click moment is, is, is built around that. And what I do is I take many of these well-known stories and I completely deconstruct them because I, I think that many of those stories are, uh, are really built for to prove a particular point for the author. Retrospectively Retros- as well. Retrospectively. Yes, yeah. So yeah, once you know the outcome, you can pick it. But you know, trying to pick it beforehand, it doesn't make it compelling reading. Because most of the time when you pick a story beforehand, it doesn't amount to anything. <laughs> yeah. I will check it out. Franz, thank you very much for your time. And I've got no doubt our audience will have enjoyed it as much as I did. And um yeah, and have a, have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. You too. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Hi, this is Mark again. Now, as I said in my introduction, my discussion with Franz was full of very concrete and practical ways in which we can build the innovation muscle of our organization. And I found of particular interest our discussion around the typically untapped value that exists within the new hire group. And this is the perspective that we share here at the Innovation Ecosystem. The first few weeks or months after a new hire joins an organization are really prime for capturing new concepts and ideas. And after that, the natural desire to fit in, to adapt to the, uh, the received wisdom within an organization has the inevitable debilitating impact on the capacity to ask why. And the kind of powerful, uninformed questions that Warren Berger in a previous episode, episode 67, talked to us about, the kind of questions that uncover insights that are unlikely to come from within an established system are those that this new hire group are able to tap into and bring forward to the organization. And then the second piece, I mean, what Franz calls intersection hunting. This is actively looking for a field or a discipline or a person or a culture that doesn't necessarily make immediate sense and then make a connection, and then through that, you know, try and tackle an issue or an opportunity. This is another very practical muscle-building activity that we can exercise and we can build into our practice. And as Franz talked about with his CEO, I mean, if any of, if any of that leads you, to, for instance, to taking out a subscription to a wedding magazine, then certainly let us know. So plenty in here that reiterates previous messages and also shines a light on some activities that, that you're able to perform in order to, to build the innovation muscle to really tap into this Medici effect that Franz talks so articulately about. Hope you found this of interest. Jump over to our website, www.innovationecosystem.com, and you can look at some of our previous episodes, as well as find out some of the other things that we're doing as we're building out our footprint in our business. And feel free to let us know what you're thinking of the podcast, of the guests. If you've got any future guests that you'd like to recommend, my email address is mark at innovationecosystem.com. And until next time, this is Mark Bidwell, Changing Perspectives, one podcast at a time. Mm-hmm.